Okay, so today we're going to start a new topic on uh, metal casting. And over the next uh, five lectures, we're going to be discussing the fundamentals of this uh, manufacturing process. So we're going to be looking at uh, the solidification process of metals and alloys. Um, what are the theorems and design applications in terms of fluid flow? Some of the most common tests in terms of fluidity and very importantly, how uh, the heat transfer process affects the structure and also the properties of your casted parts. Uh, we're also gonna be looking at some of the most common defects and how can we uh, avoid those defects by controlling the flow and the solidification process of our materials. And then uh, during lecture nine and 10 next week, uh, we're gonna be discussing some of the most common processes and equipments used in the different metal casting uh, systems. How can we classify them? And we'll be focusing particularly on uh, sand casting investments and die casting. And then finally, just some considerations in terms of the design, the design of the molds, design of the parts to avoid some of the most common problems in terms of metal casting, the most common materials, and some uh, economical considerations that we need to take into account when selecting uh, each of these um, casting processes. So for today, um, we're going to be uh, discussing the solidification of metals and alloys, and this is uh, quite important, uh, especially in terms of the differences between the solidification process of these materials. Uh, also, how uh, the, the cooling rates or the solidification process may affect the properties of your uh, materials, and how can we use some of the uh, most common theorems, some of them you're already uh, familiar with, like the Bernoulli, and the mass of flow continuity in terms of the control of the fluid flow. And how can we use this to actually design um, sprues or channels uh, inside our uh, molds to uh, produce parts without uh, defects? Okay, and this is gonna be the last part of today's lecture in terms of the application of these theorems to uh, sprue design and control of flow of metals into our uh, molds. So as you probably have discussed in some of the previous lectures, the casting process is probably one of the oldest methods in manufacturing. It was uh, probably first used around 4000 BC, initially to make ornaments, uh, copper uh, arrowheads, and um, many other objects. So here you have two examples like this uh, bronze horse that was found in China um, that dates back to 3000 uh, BC, but also uh, Etruscan castings um, still with the runners. So the runners are these channels that transport the material into the mold that would then give shape, in this case, to a statue, uh, but that can give shape to any part that you want to manufacture. Also in ancient Greece, uh, most of the bronze statues were uh, actually created using uh, metal casting processes. This is an example of a statue uh, that dates back to 450 BC. More recently, um, already in Europe, uh, around the 16th century, all the cannons that were placed in the ships, they were actually manufactured using metal casting. So, as you can see, it's a, a very simple process that can be used for a wide range of applications uh, and also using a wide range of metal materials with different properties. So this is what makes it quite attractive in terms of manufacturing. So, but it wasn't just in terms of uh, old artifacts or objects that manufacturing, that casting was actually important. Still nowadays, and despite being uh, such an old process in terms of manufacturing, it's still currently used in our industries, either to manufacture engine blocks or cylinder heads, transmission housings, pistons, uh, turbines, and wheels. So as you can see, it can be used to manufacture a wide range of products, some of them that have uh, less uh, demanding requirements in terms of their precision, 
in terms of their accuracy, in terms of their functionality, but also parts that require a much higher precision. And this is possible due to the vast range of metal casting processes that we can use. Okay, and we'll be discussing some of them over the next five uh, lectures. So the casting process, um, it's, it's quite simple um, generally. It involves normally the melting of a metal, and this is then uh, subsequently poured into a mold where we have the negative of the part that we want to build. Once this molten metal is injected into the mold, it starts to solidify. And once solidified, we can remove it from our mold and obtain our final part. So this is just in general terms that there is much more into the casting process. And we need to have uh, some considerations into uh, account, okay? So very importantly for the quality of the parts that we're manufacturing using casting is the control over the flow of the metal into the mold cavity. This can be quite problematic in terms of um, the generation of different defects, as we will be discussing. Uh, so controlling the flow is one of the most important things and one of the primary reasons that um, often we obtain parts that are faulty. Also, and after the material uh, flows into the cavity, it's very important to control its solidification. Um, the solidification process and the rate at which we promote the solidification of our parts is a major influence in terms of the structure of the materials that you produce, that you obtain, and also on the functionality and the mechanical properties of your parts. Uh, and also, and finally, uh, the influence of the type of mold uh, material that we use. And this has a direct influence on the solidification uh, process of your uh, material, as you'll be able to see over the next uh, slides. I would just like to briefly show you uh, a video um, that illustrates, uh, this is the, the case of a sand casting, so it's a very a uh, simple uh, manufacturing uh, casting uh, process, uh, but it illustrates in general the principles of uh, metal casting. When casting metal, jobbing molding is ideal where small numbers of components are required at minimum cost. One half of the pattern is placed face down in a box which forms the bottom half of the mould and is called a drag. Green sand, which consists of sand plus 2-3% to 3 clay and water, is sifted over the pattern and then pressed around it so as to obtain good shape definition. More sand is added and is compacted with a peg rammer, spiralling from the outside towards the centre of the drag. The last compaction of the sand in the drag is carried out using a flat rammer. The excess sand is struck off and the drag turned over, revealing the pattern and mould joint face. Talcum powder, which acts as a parting agent, is dusted onto the surface. The top half of the pattern is added. The pattern for the riser and for the tapered down sprue are positioned on the drag and the runner, a groove which allows the metal to flow between them, is marked in. The riser will also act as a head to feed the casting and as a swell gate to clean the metal before it enters the mould. The top box, called a cope, is placed on top of the drag. The riser and down sprue are replaced. As before, fine sand is pressed around the pattern and the cope is rammed up. The top is struck off. A pouring basin is cut into the sand so as to ensure a smooth flow of metal into the down sprue. A smooth metal flow is important in obtaining a clean casting. 
The cope is wrapped and removed from the drag. An end gate is cut from the riser into the pattern. In the other half of the mould, the cope, the runner between the down sprue and the riser is cut in. The half patterns in the cope and in the drag are wrapped and carefully removed. A core is placed in the cavity left by the pattern and forms the hole that is present in the final casting. The cope and drag are reassembled. Molten aluminium is poured carefully into the down sprue. The metal spins as it fills the riser. The metal is allowed to cool and solidify. One of the big advantages of green sand moulding is that the sand can be recycled and the process is essentially pollution free. So, as you can see here, um, this obviously is um, a very um, manual process. I'd just like to make you aware that not all the casting processes are as manual and labor intensive as this one. Um, many of the processes that I use, for example, to manufacture uh, engine blocks, where you require a much higher precision and resolution in terms of the parts that you want to manufacture. These are normally fully automated processes. Um, one of the benefits, uh, and we'll discuss uh, some of the benefits and advantages and some of the limitations of the processes, uh, but in general is uh, the ability of using uh, low cost materials for the creation of the molds, but also the ability of creating uh, very large parts. And as mentioned in the video, uh, if you use a green sand to create the mold, uh, you have the possibility of recycling that green sand and to produce another part using the same material. So this makes the process a bit more uh, sustainable. But we will discuss that a bit more in detail in uh, the future uh, lectures. So after uh, the molten metal is poured into the mold, there are a series of events that take place uh, during the solidification of the metal and it's uh, cooling uh, down to the ambient uh, temperature. Obviously these, these events will, as I've, as I've said before, can greatly influence not just the size or the shape and uniformity of, um, of the parts and, um, and the, the structure of your material, but also the chemical composition of the grains formed throughout the casting, which, uh, as said before, will influence the overall properties of uh, the metals. So there are some factors that affect the solidification uh, process. One is a type of metal, as we will see today. So depending if you are using a pure metal or an alloy, the solidification process will be different, will occur in different conditions. Also, the thermal properties of the metal and the mold, okay, because it will influence the rate at which you are able to dissipate it and to solidify. The relationship, the geometrical relationship between the volume and the surface area of the casting, obviously, as you can easily imagine, the higher will be the surface area to exchange heat with at room temperature, the faster will be your solidification rate. And therefore, uh, the structure of your uh, grains and the composition of your grains will also be influenced by this. And finally, the shape of the mold, as uh, we will talk when uh, we discuss the design aspects. So starting with uh, pure metals. So because a, a pure metal has a clearly defined melting temperature or freezing point, as it's normally used in the industry, it means that we'll, it will solidify at a constant temperature. So when we look at this graphic, so this is a, a schematic representation of the solidification process of a pure metal. After um, the temperature of the mold drops to its solidification point or freezing temperature, it will remain constant while the latent heat of fusion is dissipated or given off. 
So the solidification front, so solid liquid interface, moves through the molten metal from the mold walls in towards the center. So near the mold walls, your temperature will be lower, which means that your material will solidify um, uh, before then in the inner parts of your mold. And as you move away from the wall towards the inner part of the mold, uh, you will have a higher temperature and therefore a lower solidification or um, freezing rate. The solidified metal uh, called casting is taken out of the mold and the mold is allowed to cool at ambient temperature. So the main point about the solidification of pure metals, there is much more that we could discuss about this in terms of the different structures that are formed at different stages of the solidification process. But what you need to retain is that in terms of the use of pure metals, the solidification of these materials will always happen at a constant temperature. And this is, um, important because of the structure of the materials that we form. So this is an example of the grain structure that normally develops in casting, as you can see in this figure that illustrates a cross section of box uh, shaped mold. So what you see here is that at the mold walls, which are, as I've said before, at ambient temperature, the metal will cool down uh, much more rapidly. And this will uh, induce uh, the formation of a solidified uh, skin or shell, a very fine equivoxed uh, grains. These grains uh, grow in opposite uh, directions to that of the heat transfer. So the heat transfer will move from the inner part towards the wall and the grains will grow from the walls towards the inner part of the mold. Um, as they grow in opposite directions, uh, to that of the, of the heat transfer uh, direction, this will lead to the formation of these column-like grains. Those grains that have different orientations, uh, at some point they are blocked from growing, okay, and they will become equivoxed and coarse. In terms of um, the alloys, and this is why uh, I was saying that it's important uh, to retain this idea that the solidification process is quite different. In this case, as you can see here in this graphic, <coughs> the solidification of the alloys normally begin when the temperature drops below what we normally call the liquid temperature, and it's complete when it reaches the solidus uh, temperature. Within this temperature range, so between TL and TS, uh, the alloy is in a mushy or past, uh, or pasty uh, state. And as you can see here, this is basically uh, consisting of these column-like uh, structures with uh, dendrites. And depending on how uh, fast this uh, process will happen, uh, the the, the length and the space between these dendrites will also uh, be uh, different. But the importance is that you remember that the solidification of the alloys will not happen at a constant temperature. It will happen between a range of temperatures between TL and TS. And we have normally the material in this mushy state that it's normally characterized by the formation of these dendrites. So the rate at which we cool down our material will have an effect in terms of the structures that we form. So a finer grain uh, size uh, normally means uh, better mechanical properties. This is just a general uh, assumption. So depending on the cooling rate, as we've said, different structures can be formed. If we have slow cooling rates, this normally results in these coarse uh, dendritic structures because you give them time to actually be formed and they will always have very large space between the dendrites arms. 
if instead, if you increase the cooling rate, so if you increase the, the exchange of heat, the structures become more finer with very, uh, or with smaller dense right arm spacing. And if you further increase this exchange of heat, then the structures will become amorphous. So we don't give enough time for the material to form these dendritic arms. The structures that are developed, and as we said, the resulting grain sizes will have an enormous impact in terms of the mechanical properties of your parts. And if you decrease the grain size, so if you increase the cooling rates, what will happen is that you will increase the overall mechanical properties or strength of your parts. But the ductility of the cast alloy will decrease. And why does this happen? So if you increase the cooling rate, it means that you'll form these very fine grains. A finer grain size means that you have more boundaries, more grain boundaries. And more grain boundaries means a greater resistance uh, to dislocation. It is the measured ability of a material to withstand uh, you know, very large plastic deformation that makes the material less ductile. So these are important concepts that you need to know. You increase the strength of, of, of your parts by decreasing the grain size, but you decrease the ductility because obviously you have more grain boundaries that will create more resistance to dislocation of your uh, material. Also, you will decrease uh, the microporosity in the casting because you'll have much finer, more compacted uh, grain sizes. And the tendency to crack, or as we normally say, to generate hot tears uh, during the solidification process of your material will also decrease. So having smaller grains in a controlled manner in general allows you to obtain parts with much better mechanical uh, performance. And it is by controlling these uh, cooling rates, not just the cooling rates, but also the cooling rates, that you can manipulate and uh, fine tune the properties of the part that you are uh, creating, depending on the application or final application of the part. In metal casting, uh, or in basic gravity casting systems, uh, to put it that way, uh, the molten metal is poured normally uh, through uh, pouring basing or cup, as you can see in here and as you've seen in the video. The material is then uh, transported or flows down uh, the sprue into the runner, down into the gate, and the gate is basically the interface between the runners and your molds. Um, and then it flows down into the molds where you already have the negative of the part that you want to create. And then the material is allowed to solidify and you can then open the molds and remove your part. You need to know these uh, general components of a metal casting system. And you also need to know uh, their uh, function. Um, Two important considerations. One in terms of the sprue, and this is critical for the parts that you are manufacturing to be able to create parts without defects. Normally, the sprue is uh, tapered, okay? And as we'll see today, the introduction of these tapered uh, designs is extremely important to avoid uh, turbulent flows that will create, for example, aspiration of solid or gas particles that will lead onto the creation of parts with porosity, because as we know, those are detrimental to the mechanical properties of your parts. Also, because, and as we've seen in, uh, in a similar way to metal, uh, to additive manufacturing using uh, metal powders, we normally have shrinkage of our parts as the material solidifies. And it is important that we compensate for that shrinkage to ensure that the parts are geometrically and dimensionally accurate. And a way of compensating for that as your part solidifies inside the mold is to provide additional material to compensate for that volumetric shrinkage. And that is the function of the riser. The riser that can be a top open riser, which means that 
the riser will sit on top of the part that you are casting and it's open because it's in contact with the atmosphere or it can be a side riser. The position of the riser depends on many factors, but it mainly is, it's mainly decided depending on the geometry of your parts, as we will see also in these uh, lectures. But what you need to have uh, very um, clear in your mind is that volumetric shrinkage is normally compensated by the introduction of uh, risers that supply additional molten metal to compensate for um, the volumetric shrinkage that is caused by the solidification process. As we said, in terms of metal casting, the control of the flow of the, of the metal into the molds is extremely uh, important. And a way of doing that is by uh, designing appropriate uh, running channels. And there are um, two basic principles uh, for that. One that you, I think you're very uh, familiar already, which is the Bernoulli uh, theorem, and the other one is the law um, of flow continuity. So the Bernoulli theorem, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but this theorem is based on the principle of the conservation of momentum and relates pressure with velocity, the elevation of the fluid at any location in the system, and the frictional losses in a system that is full of liquid, as you can see uh, in here. Okay, one and two basically uh, indicate uh, the position within your um, in your uh, casting system. The law of mass or flow continuity uh, states that for a fluid that is incompressible, for a liquid that is incompressible, and in a system that have impermeable walls, the rate of flow is constant at any point. Okay. And it's the application of these two principles that uh, we've just mentioned that is normally used for the design of sprues with uh, tapered features uh, to control the flow of the metal into your uh, mold. So how is that used? So tapered means that you normally have this angle, so it's not just a straight channel. Uh, how do we do this and what is the rationale for the application of these type of designs? So one of the important things that we always tend to avoid in metal casting is aspiration. And aspiration is normally driven by turbulent flows. And we can have aspiration not just of gas particles, but for example, in sand casting, as you can easily imagine, the mold walls or the sprues they are uh, made of sand particles. If the flow is uh, turbulent, you are at the risk of dragging some of those particles with the molten metal into the inside of the mold. And during the solidification process, they will remain trapped and cause uh, porosity. So some of the, in order to avoid that, we need to assume that uh, the, the, the sprue or the pressure uh, in the sprue should be uh, greater or at least equal to the exit uh, atmospheric pressure. So we assume that the pressure at point one, so at the entrance of your sprue, is equal to the pressure at the exit of your sprue and it's equal to the atmospheric pressure. The other simplification that we also do is that we are assuming we have no frictional losses, okay? We do have, but we are assuming that uh, those frictional losses are residual. And if we do that simplification, we can obtain this simplified version of um, the Bernoulli uh, theorem. If we assume that at point one, um, at the entrance of the sprue or in the basin cup, the cross-sectional area is much, much larger than at the exit of the sprue, we can assume that the velocity at the entrance of the sprue is equal uh, to zero. It's not in reality zero, but it's much, much lower when compared 
to the velocity at the exit of the sprue, and therefore we assume that it's zero. If we do that, then using point two or the exit of the sprue as our reference plane, where the height is zero, then we can easily calculate the velocity at the exit of the sprue, uh, which is the square root of two times g gravity force times the height of your, your, of your sprue. So this is uh, a way, a simple way of um, calculating the velocity at the exit of the sprue that we then can use to um, design our tapered sprues, like defining the cross-sectional area at the exit to ensure that we have a velocity uh, that will not cause turbulence of our flow. And um, I'll not go through this question today, but I'll leave it to you. Uh, I also have um, a video, a synchronous video that you can access with a solution for this question that will be released uh, uh, tomorrow or Wednesday. But in the meantime, I'd like you to try and attempt to solve this question. And basically what we're saying here is that the volume flow rate of the metal into the mold is 0 0.01 cubic meters per minute. So we know the volume flow rate. The top uh, of the sprue has a diameter of 20 millimeters. So we know this uh, dimension. And we also know the length of the sprue, which is also 20 millimeters. What we want to know is the cross-sectional area at the exits of the sprue that will ensure uh, that we will not have aspiration, okay? So here you'll have to apply these two theorems to understand what is the cross-sectional area that will uh, prevent the aspiration of solid particles into uh, your uh, metal, okay? Uh, so please try and attempt to do this before you're watching the video with uh, the solution. And this is a typical uh, question, um, obviously not exactly the same, but these are the type of questions that uh, we can ask in an exam uh, for you to apply these two theorems to determine either the velocity or the cross-sectional area. So design uh, features of your sprues to ensure uh, that you don't have aspiration of solid particles and as a consequence, the generation of uh, defects. And this brings us to the end of the lecture. So just to summarize, as we've said before, the casting process is in general a quite simple process. There are variations depending if you're using, for example, sand casting uh, or if you're using investment casting and we'll see that in the future lectures, but in general, uh, it's important that we control the flow of the material that will avoid the generation of defects. It's also very important to understand that there are differences in terms of the, of the solidification process of uh, the, the metals that we use, and this is different for pure metals and alloys. Uh, and also importantly, we can use uh, both the Bernoulli's theorem and the law of mass continuity uh, as tools to design the running channels and control the flow of the metal and in that way avoid the aspiration of particles that can lead onto the generation of defects. You also need to uh, know what are the different uh, parameters that can affect uh, the solidification of the metals and how that uh, will impact the mechanical properties of your uh, parts, okay? So these are things that you need to uh, know. If you do have questions about this, um, and if we don't have time today to go through all of them, please do feel free to post them on um, the chat. Okay, we'll also have more examples, uh, calculations, uh, mathematical examples um, during our uh, tutorial sessions on this topic. Okay, and um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have uh, now as well. Hello, sir.